So just by way of introduction, I'm just going to say a quick few words, and then we'll, we'll show the film. So my name is, uh, oh, you can't hear me? No. Yeah, there's a problem here. OK, I'm just going to have to project, um, because uh, it doesn't seem like the mic is working here. You can hear me now, right? No? I thought I have a, like a loud voice. So my name is um, Sean Jacobs. And I'm on the International Affairs faculty um, in the Milano School. Um, and this event is part of a series uh, called Hollywood and the, Cold, and the New Cold War. So I've written some notes down, so I, I might read some of it and just uh, sort of speak of the cuff in, in to some extent. But uh, when my colleague Nina Khrushcheva asked me to program an event for this series, Hollywood and the, Co and the New Cold War, I immediately thought about this film Forward Ever, The Killing of a Revolution. Um, my interest, or, or what drew my, my, my attention to it, was to broaden the scope of the series outside the familiar sites of the US and the Soviet Union. I know that, to some extent, we can say the Soviet Union had its designs in the Caribbean, and so did the US. But it's to perhaps think about agency within, the, within other parts of, of the world. So as we know, the Cold War had a profound effect on African, Asian. Oh, can I? OK, I'll project more. As we know, the Cold War has had a profound effect on African, Asian, Latin American, as well as Caribbean nations and peoples. Whether it would be through the US embargo against Cuba, the US propping up dictatorships in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, or destabilizing politics in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Growing up in apartheid South Africa in the 1970s and 1980s, Cuba featured large in our imagination. So did Jamaica and Michael Manley. We only heard about Canada when then President Ronald Reagan, a friend of apartheid, ordered the invasion of that island. We had heard of Maurice Bishop and the kind of experiment that he and his comrades wanted to implement on the island. And so Grenada also took on some kind of political status for us. But to some extent, we knew a lot about the invasion, but very little about the agency of, of people in Grenada and the events that led to that invasion. Now, for those people who don't know that revolution, that revolution was very powerful. It happened during a very exciting time in the Caribbean. As I just mentioned, the people from the Caribbean, this is not news or, or you know, surprising. But this is a time when, when in Jamaica, it's the, you know, the, the, the height of Bob Marley's uh, uh, popularity and the spread of Bob Marley. I mean, growing up in South Africa again, um, Bob Marley as a, as a major kind of world figure. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Michael Manley already. But in Grenada in particular, we had um, sort of the growth of political autonomy, major literacy, liter literacy campaigns, um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, innovations around housing, the role, the role of women, um, and all kinds of programs with regard to cultural production. And so what the film does is to kind of balance that. And, I, and again, as I said, I don't want to give too much away. The film goes into some of the achievements of the, re the revolution, but also in the title, the reference to um, the killing of a revolution, it also deals with how, um, how things uh, began to fall apart. So that's all I'm going to, I don't, because I think the film really helps us to get a better understanding of that. And the film is directed by Bruce Paddington, who's a lecturer at the University of West Indies. Um, in St. Uh, Augustine in Trinidad and Tobago, who also directed the film The Mennonites of Belize. Um, Bruce is not here with us, but after the screening, we've invited Nigel Cunningham, who's an assistant professor of English at Hunter College and a former managing editor of Small Acts, which is a, a, a journal, uh, a Caribbean journal of criticism, to make some comments. Um, I'll introduce Nigel properly after the screening. And then we'll have some questions. We'll have time for questions uh, from the audience. So without further ado, uh, why don't we just hit the lights and we can see the film? So thanks for staying. Um, we we actually have the room until seven o'clock, so um, we can have like a long discussion if you want. So um, uh, let me just introduce Niger again. So. The, the idea was just to have, uh, so let me, uh, Nigel Cunningham, he's an assistant professor of English at Hunter College um, and the former managing editor of Small Acts, a Caribbean journal for criticism 
where he's now the project coordinator. His research interests are in black studies, performance studies, visual culture, and post-colonial criticism. His current book project, which is tentatively entitled Quiet Dawn, uh, considers issues uh, of time, revolution, and the afterlife of the 1960s. So what we'll do is I've asked Niger to um, just give us, make some comments about the film, um, and then we'll just uh, um, open it for questions uh, from you. I'm, I may have some questions, but I think it might be more interesting to see where questions from the audience go. So do you want to uh, speak, Niger? Yeah, definitely. Oh, you can hear me? Great. Um, well, I just wanted to thank uh, Sean and um, Gabrielle, right? Hi. Thank you. Um, for the kind invitation to talk with you today. And um, I'm going to keep my remarks fairly quick because I'd love to hear more about um, what you all thought about the film. And I, I see myself right now trying to frame, sorry, I see myself right now just providing a frame for thinking about what um, Bruce Patton Films is doing and um, more particularly, what does it allow to come into view? So um, when we first sat down, Sean talked about uh, agency and uh, the somewhat unknown story or, uh, okay, um, the kind of silenced status of the Grenada Revolution vis-a-vis -vis the Cold War and our understandings of the Cold War. Um, so can you still hear me? Great. Um, so I hope that my comments will be able to lead to that. So I'm going to make three points. One point is about the Cold War. Um, and how that gets registered in the film. Uh, the second point is gonna be a quick observation around what gender does in the film, and um, specifically around the ways that feminized labor, I don't know if you notice how feminized labor comes to structure, um, the potential that was lost in Grenada. So we'll just touch on that real quick. And then lastly, a more obscure point about how the film um, mediates what I'm calling these afterlives of uh, killed revolution. Um, sorry, someone waved, hi. <laughs> Um, so I should make it clear that in my eyes, this film is not just about the Grenada Revolution, but it also is a film about Caribbean cinema as well. Um, some of you might not know of a Bruce Paddington, but he is easily considered one of the forefathers of Caribbean cinema. And that's not only in regards to his long career as a director and a producer, but also in light of his many writings on Caribbean cinema. So since the 1990s, Paddington has been a prominent figure criticizing what we could all know as the cultural hegemony of Hollywood in relationship to the Caribbean. And um, he's also been one to point out the deep entanglements of cinema with the various colonial and imperial projects that have gone in play inside the Caribbean since cinema's inception in 1895. Yet in the face of this reign of cultural dominance, Paddington nevertheless advocates for how technological advancements in film and video production hold the potential to, and I'm quoting him here, counter, if not conquer, foreign domination of the airwaves and to actively assert and project a unique independent Caribbean culture, end quote. So what is important to note here, and I just want us to think about this, is how Paddington already has his own understanding of how cinema and politics are linked together. And I'm trying to just make room so we could think about how we might understand the political significance of the film alongside how Paddington understands the significance of Caribbean cinema. Um, recently, in a piece that he co-written with Keith Warren, Paddington claims, quote, from a global perspective, Caribbean cinema is still in its infancy, and its progress reflects a state of political development of the region, um, end quote. So in Forward Ever, we see how film is made to reflect political development of Grenada, specifically the promise and tragic failure of the revolution. The fact that the film is framed by Paddington's own memory of the Grenada Revolution, it opens up about how he remembers being there in the 1980s, that speaks to how loss, the very thing called loss, represents um, so much to what the revolution could have been. So I'm interested in here, what does loss represent? And also, how does that loss haunt our present? So um, one question I want us to think about together is how does this film remember the Grenada Revolution? And I think that's a more interesting question than whether or not the film gets it right. Um, I have a quick image up there. And uh, on the top of it is a quote that came to mind after watching the documentary from um, Trin Minha um, in her um, 
important essay, The Totalizing Quest of Meaning, where she writes, there's no such thing as documentary. Whether the term designates a category of material, a genre, an approach, or a set of techniques. And um, it might seem a little weird that I'm talking about a documentary to first say that there's no such thing as a documentary. Um, but the reason why I'm doing that, and I feel Trinman Haas pushing us to think about what documentary does, is to fight against these ideas of transparency that are usually associated with the form, and also to destabilize these aesthetics of objectivity, to remember that in making a film, you're actually enacting so many different aesthetic practices in order to make vivid and to dramatize and convince your audience that this rises to the level of evidence and proof. So like Trin Minha, I want to think about this film less so as objectivity and more so as a repetitive and artificial resurrection of the real. That is to suggest not that the documentary shouldn't be valid at all, but that it is itself um, bound up into notions of construction and production of history. So um, what I'm trying to do here is to invite us to take seriously um, the film's practices and procedures that are involved in the production of historical knowledge, and again, ask um, how the film functions as a mode of remembrance. So my first quick point is the Cold War. Um, we could approach this question of the Cold War not only from outside of the film, but by focusing on its archival footage. Um, I hope you noticed that this film is really made so by multiple kinds of footage put together and pieced in order to tell a story. Um, there's a really brilliant moment when Maurice Bishop compares Grenada to Cuba and Nicaragua, and that's another great moment to think about the archive and the Cold War. Um, there, he says, Grenada is different to Cuba and Nicaragua, and the Grenada Revolution is, one, in one sense, even worse, and I'm using their language. Um, here, there seems to be the United States. Then uh, seems to be worse than the Cuban and Nicaraguan revolutions because the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada speaks English and therefore can communicate directly with the people of the United States. So here, Bishop maps, maps out this imaginary topology that is the Cold War, you know, the bipolar structure between the United States and the Soviet Union. He maps that out along a linguistic divide in order to underline that the threat that Grenada represents is the fact that they speak English and that they are inside the Western Hemisphere. His statements are then followed by a quick interview by two white women, which are supposedly or presumably supposed to represent the quintessential American tourist, uh, mocking Reagan's anti-communist rhetoric about the island. So on the one hand, we have this moment of potential black solidarity, where we have Grenada, English-speaking nation, socialist nation, that's able to speak to the black Americans in the United States who are also facing oppression. And on the other hand, we have, I don't know if you noticed, the subtitles that follow right after that scene and how the subtitles are in Spanish, which remind us that that footage was prepared for a Spanish-speaking audience. So right there, we see how the Cold War is mapped on. It's how the archive is shaped, because Bruce Patterson had to go to one of the only <laughs> Caribbean institutions for film production, which is happened to be in Cuba. Because after 1959, of course, Fidel Castro saw the importance of creating our his own and the country's own cultural institutions. So now the legacy of the Cold War is not only in how we understand the US and the Soviet Union's relationship, but when we see Spanish written over a film that's already in English, right? So the film itself is shaped by the Cold War and the archive that it's mobilizing is informed by the Cold War. And the last thing I'll say on that point is Paddington's film allows us to understand the radical potential of archival practice, especially for so many of us who do not know that much about the Grenada Revolution. We have to ask ourselves, under what condition did all the other footage become destroyed? I'll give you a, a hint. Partially global warming, partially bombs, right? A lot of these materials are destroyed during the attacks, and even more hurricanes have come through Grenada and have also destroyed other materials as well. Um, Solani Puri, who has an amazing book that came out in 2014, actually touches upon this more than I can right now. Um, for the interest of time, I'm going to just touch on the point of gender and then this last point around generations and afterlives. Um, so you remember in the beginning of the film um, that Bruce Pattinson starts, he writes, in August of 1983, I visited Revolutionary Grenada as I was working on a film about science and technology. I was impressed by the enthusiasm of the people and um, visited a number of projects, including a woman's cooperative producing jams and jellies for local produce. Um, throughout the film, what I left very confused and actually curious about is how gender becomes links to development. Right? So 
to the extent that the woman, the figure of the woman, is the figure through which the entire narrative of the revolution is actually being imagined, right? Women are coming into the workplace. Men are not going into the home. No, women are coming into the workplace, right? And that becomes a marker for the potential of this revolution that was lost. Until we get to my favorite character in this entire film, which um, her name is um, Beverly Steele, who writes, I remember them calling for women to make sandwiches. <laughs> and I said, why not um, women taking a more active part um, than the usual and traditional roles? And um, if we have more time, we could think about not only the role that women play within the revolution, but also in the film. And even after their death, I'm thinking about um, Avis Ferguson and Gemma um, Belma, even after Gemma Belma's death, she becomes cover for Porgy to escape from the fort. So it's, it's a really curious question about what is the role of women in revolution, especially after the revolution has been killed. Um, I think Bruce Paddington is a place that we could, his film is a place where we could actually think and push those questions really hard. And lastly, um, as a point around generations, um, just to uh, date myself, I was born after the revolution. Um, and my, a lot of my work has been um, informed by what do we do with other generations' remembrances of the past? And one thing I say to my students, I ask them, you know, do they know Martin Luther King and Malcolm X? And they usually say yes, and I'm usually surprised because they weren't alive. And the question is, is how do different forms of memory mediate our relationship with the past? And with this uh, clip right here, or still right here, I feel this is one of the most beautiful uh, moments inside of the entire um, documentary for me, because when we read the placard, there's a claim being made. And I'm interested in the linguistic play on, on the placard itself. It's my son and slash brother, my daughter and slash sister. The sign itself almost performs the overlapping of generational experiences, right? So it's not simply that, for instance, Maurice Bishop is someone's son or is someone's father, but Maurice Bishop is a figure through which other people inherit the past. So that and slash is kind of brilliant because not only is it representing the multiple temporalities inside of this act of remembering, but it's also making us again think about film because film itself is breaking down different images and splicing them together with an and that cuts across the cut. So I'll leave it there. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I have questions, but I'm assuming that, oh, bring it this way. I have questions, but I'm assuming there are people here who live through this or, you know, um, probably have connections to, to Grenada. So I think it might be useful yeah. if we open it up for questions and if some people have short comments um, and, you know, if you want to direct. I, I'm not, I'm no expert on Grenada. I have more questions, but it would be lovely just if we can open it to the floor then. So. The way we could do it is perhaps if like we have three at a time and then if there, if in, in it there's some responses, um, or questions for Niger, he can respond and then we can go back to another round, yeah? So anybody who has a comment or a question, yeah. um, we have one, two, three already. What, one thing I thought about that was really good about the film that raised the questions, uh, being former military, U.S. Army, is that what was the motivations of the U.S. going in there and Reagan and then it wasn't covered in the film? And, and that really, you know, I thought it's much better if that was actually the film. And then I thought about it a little bit more. It's like, no, because <laughs> that is actually a cause you to question. They, and what I like about the film is that you're presented from one different side. I know. And what are the motivations and the power plays that are going on? And just, just repeat the question. that really so much is, is left motivations and what the agenda is and stuff kind of touched upon but just left to the side, which I think is really great because that causes the viewer then to come away and ask the deeper questions. And then the lesson of that is in our current time is what are the motivations and to ask those appropriate questions. And I'm just curious as to what y'all's thoughts are of that and that we play out. The gentleman the hat. Um, <clears throat> first comment in the beginning when you mentioned about the Caribbean, you left out a very important experience that happened in 1970, Trinidad and Tobago. They had a revolution. Okay? Mm -hmm. And Nixon was going to invade Trinidad and it went on longer than it did. Because there were aircraft carriers that were spotted out on the, on the side of the Fort Spaniards. 
Um, secondly, problems with the film that I have, and which this is going to be a, a theme probably been, because I've seen it before. It's, it's being used as a teaching tool. But we're mis willfully miseducating people by not letting them know that this, you know, like you, you think that this invasion happened in a few days' time. It takes a hell of a lot of time to, mo to mobilize the units and stuff that they dropped on there, which means that it was done all the time. Connecting struggles with the, uh, what was going on with Vieques, because probably where the force came from was practices in Vieques and just, uh, just turned south, okay? Um, African-centered revolution, African society, the woman is, is held in a higher uh, a position than European miseducated societies, which is why in African revolutions, the Panther Party, which is an African revolution that just happened here, which went south, the women still survived. The women took a big part in it. Okay, they were struggling, even with the young boys, because Latinos are African, okay? Which is why Castro identified the way he did which is also why Chavez was vilified because he identified the way he did. Most people don't know the reason why the, the flag of uh, Venezuela and uh, Ecuador and Colombia had red and blue on it. You have to trace it to the Christian Revolution. Um, the other piece that doesn't come out here, you know, the people that were talking about certain progress, they looked like they were part of the opposition, okay? When they were talking about redoing roads, that's not the whole truth. Grenada had no infrastructure in reference to roads. They have what we call in the Caribbean donkey trails, which means basically from the road miles in, you walk on the narrow trail, you put on your rubber boots, and you carry all your stuff in. The infrastructure that happened with uh, Bishop taking over started changing that infrastructure and building roads, which changed the dynamic also in reference to commerce and everything. And that that's part of what the progress is. And, and like I said, it is important that speaking English and seeing that happen with a little, you know, what they would call, you know, low, small Caribbean nation says a lot and was very important here. I was alive at that time. I remember the discussions and I remember the lives. And shamefully, it also is a, uh, let's say a roadmap to what happened in Iraq where you keep the press out so you can continue to lie and the lie gets passed on <laughs> through school and will be part of the common court Okay. Actually, because we're live streaming, it's questions, um, I'm going to ask that you come up here and maybe queue up in front and talk into the microphone just so our viewers online um, have a chance to hear everything that you're saying. And so you don't have to repeat. Yeah, I was, I was making notes to kind of repeat the questions yeah, with you. Yeah. Okay, so I have a quick question. Uh, my question is just uh, around the idea of a potential TRC process. Um, I'm from South Africa, and um, I'm not necessarily um, I'm proposing that it's, it's an alternative or the idea that um, for the healing journey to start. But I think that's kind of the open-end question, obviously, because, I mean, there's a lot of trauma in, this, in, the, in, in the aesthetic of, of the film, and people haven't really been allowed to kind of um, really go through a journey. So I'm just thinking, you know, um, if that's potentially a um, solution to kind of start talking about uh, the unresolved issues that, that kind of manifested. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think there's some, there's, we've got, uh, if you want to respond on the question of um, uh, kind of the amount, you know, the issue of like uh, foregrounding you, the, 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 mm -hmm. the US military um, and the US government, the, 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 some of the misrepresentations in the mm -hmm. film, mm -hmm. and then I think this question about the TRC, which I think I mean we've talked about this before we before we got here, which is that there is a, there, David David Scott right in his book. There's a great book by the way on the Grenada <laughs> Revolution. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. There's a great book on the Grenada Revolution called Omens of Adversity by David Scott, who's a professor at Columbia, and that that deals partly raises some of the questions around. Uh, uh, truth and reconciliation uh, process, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I could start at the end and then come back to the other two points around uh, truth and reconciliation. I would recommend definitely checking out um, David Scott's book, Omens of Adversity. Um, but uh, just a quick 
point is that there have been truth and reconciliation processes mm -hmm. that have gone down and um, to a certain extent failed. Um, and uh, that's the limit of my knowledge <laughs> right there. But I, what I also could say is um, you bring up this point about what kind of models of justice do we have in order to think about um, how to deal with the past. And I think uh, what becomes really difficult, back to the point of misrepresentation, is that when our model, and this is not critique of any process at all, but when our model is trauma, for instance, right? Trauma isolates a particular moment of violence, right? As if the trauma of the Grenada Revolution is what we need to get over. But what I think um, the gentleman before was saying is that even the simple fact that the United States had a military presence inside of the Caribbean already speaks to a kind of domination or even a structural violence that preceded the um, invasion itself, right? So does trauma and forgiveness localize experiences of violence in such a way that when we get over one, that may obscure others, right? So that's one way to think about, you know, can we really transport different models of reconciliation and justice? One, one, con one, 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 one um, truth, just one of the truths that the feet carries is loss, right? Um, and how do we grapple with the, um, the fact that um, it's not only the misrepresentation in schools, but literal archives are being destroyed, have been destroyed. What was so fascinating for me was to see Hunter College, where I work, <laughs> being the location where Maurice Bishop gave his talk, where Hunter College right now is not being seen as the local focal point of third world revolution. Hunter College right now is being confronted with what? Targeting by the very New York State itself. Trying to even keep it open <laughs> is the challenge, right? So what we're learning from this film is situating a larger project of defeat, <laughs> a larger project of undermining different radical projects that link Grenada to um, affirmative action uh, protest that was also happening in the 1980s that links it to um, also uh, to uh, other any kind of black radical project that is unimaginable right now. And I think that's what you're reminding us is the importance of just memory and the importance of carrying these stories and challenging the institutions that are built to shut them down. And the last part, um, I think it's a great point about just the framing of the film. Another part is the question of scale. Right? Because on the one hand, the reason why Grenada could be easily wiped out of our memories is because the United States and Soviet Union are on such a global scale as well. And this film does a really good job by mediating between the local and the global in order to displace our own expectations about what should be the motivating force behind this entire event. Is it the US invading and actually informing people to assassinate Morris Bishop, or is it a disagreement between two close yeah. colleagues. We don't know. And I think the film pushes us into that direction. Um, and the last point just around uh, the question of um, inspira the inspiration for Reagan, after watching this film, I can't be on the train anymore and see the St. George advertisement <laughs> for St. George University. Those are on the New York subway. It's the same St. George that you, know, you could get a medical degree without having to take certain exams. You know, WBAI has uh, audio of other students about the truth about it. I'm sorry, if you have a question, can you go to the microphone? Sorry about Usually I get sent out of the class. <laughs> what I was going to say is two things. One, the threat of the, when you look at the women, the policy of women that were accomplished by that revolution real quick, it was a threat to Reagan and any of the fascists in this country because they were reversing issues with women. You know, like in a short time, women had paid maternity leave. You're still fighting about that now, and et cetera. Um, the other piece is that WBAI, which has been under attack, we, in, the, in Pacific Archives, we had, and Bernard White used to play it. We used to have these things around historical events. So we actually played the students that said there was nothing going on. There was nothing wrong. Uh, we saw a, a, a snippet of that with the women in the car saying, hey, you know, there's nothing happening here. And um, some of the books tell basically, you know, a whole different story, you know, with the Cubans. They, they, the, but Reagan put that airport to use very shortly after he reinstalled that, you know, alien worshiping uh, person.
I'll, I'll leave it. I, I, <laughs> I'm online. I don't want to curse. Can I just make a, a quick comment on the, the question of the TRC? Um, the, in Scott's book, actually, he um, spent some time on, on, on the, the court case that the his argument is that the um, the group of men, you know, who are, I mean, it's, it's clear that they killed um, Maurice Bishop and the, I think it's the other five people, right? His argument is that the, they were interrogated by the US Army. Mm -hmm. And so then there was a quick court case. And so even that, even that whole process itself, Yes, they're yes they're guilty of the murders, but the the accusation that some of the other people in the Central Committee ordered it, that some of that stuff even has to be interrogated. So those men at the end who say, you know, I went to prison for 25 years, but I did nothing wrong. There is also a way in which we have to confront that. Like so, so one one of the one one thing about the film is you can you get sort of like, you go along with this kind of you know Maurice Bishop as a martyr, which which I mean it's clear he got murdered, right? But there's also a way in which you have to ask questions as a viewer about the the guilt not of the people who shot Bishop, but these people in the Central Committee, because you had this like so that's why you have all this anger. You have these people who feel sort of like I did nothing, why am, why am I in prison? And then you have the relatives of people who are still trying to find their bodies. Yeah. But you want to see? No, I think okay, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for showing this. I had never this sort of remarkable footage to see them talking about what happened, because as those of us who recall this remember, the whole incident was that the Central Committee had fought with them themselves, and that gave the excuse to do what happened. Now, I had two friends who jumped into Grenada, who were in the Ranger Regiment and in the Airborne Battalion that went into the airstrip, all right? So they weren't raiding off the Ekes. It was a hastily organized operation. The ready battalion at Fort Bragg was put on aircraft, and the Ranger Battalion down at Fort Stewart were the first units that jumped in. And when I talked to the people who explained to me what happened, they were fighting against Cuban troops. There were Cuban troops who had been in Angola who were defending that airstrip. They were on reverse slope positions. It was a fight. Now, uh, what is not mentioned in this movie which someone who remembers what happened knows, is that this occurred at the same time that the Marine barracks were blown up in Lebanon. So that battalion of Marines that comes in to uh, land there is a battalion rotating to go to Lebanon. And that, as, as one remembers, that was when the, the barrack, barrack, uh, barrack bombing, uh, the bombing of the Marine barracks happened. So that happened at the same time. Another problem in looking at this is that you know, the use of uh, Daniel Ortega and Castro doesn't really give the person a sense of what was occurring. Because Reagan's uh, chief of the CIA at the time, Casey, was engaged in a huge plethora of covert operations around the world, including, as Sean knows, the uh, support of UNITA in, in Angola. Uh, and so, there ha so that's sort of removed from that. And those of us who know that story, you know, we're familiar with it, but that's sort of not seen there. You have to sort of know that. So, you know, and, and of course, the beginning of the Contra Wars was going on with, against uh, the, the Sandinistas. So all that is sort of kept out. You know, you, you have to know that. And, and, and I think the filmmaker, uh, the power of the film is that local stuff. But the wider picture is, frankly, not done well, OK? Because that, I think, would have amplified it and made it more comprehensible that this is something happening on a global scale. And here they had an opportunity to knock Bishop out because of the internal fight. They took it immediately. And so I was wondering, you know, the filmmaker, I don't know. I, I know people have done uh, FOIAs on the, the, the kind of stuff in the Reagan administration. I don't know what documents they looked at, you know, which could have amplified it. But again, the power of the film is just to see those people talk. I'd never seen that happen before, and that was amazing to watch. But I just that's just my f first feeling of critique of the film. Since people have to come up and since people have to come up and down, why don't why don't if you want to respond or say make comments or giving people an opportunity to at least walk down? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think those are different ways of responding to. I'm not too sure if, I appreciate your comments, I'm not too sure if that's a critique, because if anything, 
Um, it's de it's demonstrating like the act of watching a film, <laughs> right? And I think what you're doing is that you're mobilizing and you're helping us situating in a larger frame. But I think there is much to be said about the same question: Where does the Caribbean lie within the Cold War, right? Because as soon as we start to zoom out, it becomes a story about American imperialism, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that those are either ors, but it's a challenge that we're given right now: is to do we have to narrate this experience of the island through the very same relation of domination that it's under, right? Do we have to then always come to the position of the United States in order to think about the lived experiences that are happening there? Um, that's what I'll say for now, but I'd love to also hear from people who don't remember, because um, I think that's what's so fascinating about the film. I was going to work today, and someone saw one of the books I was reading, and he was like, what is the Grenada Revolution, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I think no matter what we might say about where the film falls short, we are still dealing with a very fundamental reality in which knowledge is lost. And a lot of future generations are not just losing that knowledge, but have to actually come up with new strategies to rethink the past. And I think um, this is a moment better than now. There's no other moment better than now for us to ask, how do younger generations try to remember what they've never experienced. <laughs> so the point I was trying to make um, earlier, Jim you know, brought that up as with regards to zooming out and looking at American imperialism. What I really liked about the film is it didn't do that. And um, so to, to counter what Jim says, I think, it, I think it's, that's a strength of it. Because what happens, if you look at all the players in the film, as far as all the political uh, players in the film, they're all corrupt. <laughs> the, you know, uh, Maurice Bishop talks about the counter-revolution. And you have to have the counter-revolution. And you know, the people are saying, well, there's 1,000 people in jail at that time. There's 3,000 people in jail at that time under him. So you know, it, it, they're all, they all have their own propaganda slant. And what's interesting about that is, is that it shows that. And that's what I think is, is fantastic about the film. And then it just makes you question, like, who, who's telling the truth and what is the truth? Uh, and you ask the deeper questions. Mm -hmm. And I think another point is how um, that antagonism may be constitutive of politics itself. I think there's a way in which we may um, see this as a failure of people finding consensus, but maybe it's a failure to finding a form for the antagonism itself, right? I think what I love about this moment is that it forced me to rethink politics, right? Can antagonism be generative of a state form? Can the state still hold that together without falling apart? Some may say no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I remember the uh, Grenadian invasion and the revolution. And um, though I didn't hear Maurice Bishop at Hunter, uh, BAI broadcast his speech, not from Hunter, but his very speech when he came to New York. I think he came to the UN as well. I'm not sure. But he, he made this trip to New York. And I remember tuning in on BAI, and I was he, he was one of my heroes, <laughs> and he was a Jeffersonian Democrat, maybe a Democratic Socialist, but he was very different from the other revolutionary leaders around. And the fact that he was being demonized at the time was very surprising. I mean, I, I think I recorded on tape the speech. I got lost over the years, but it was one of those things that I had kept. And um, so this film was, important in that it brought it home in detail of what that revolution accomplished. But there were, and I thought the part of the Americans who were visiting, giving lie to the propaganda at the time, as well as the students at St. George who um, didn't want to go home. At that time, I remember when we were trying to figure out what was going on and who was doing what to whom, the excuse of going in to save these students was apparently you know, a farce, but you have it in the film, and it did come through at that time, if you 
had the right access to sources other than the mainstream media, that the students said they weren't in danger, they didn't want to come home, and they also gave lie to it. And what I liked about this film in that regard is so much of it resonated with the lies today. So for the people who don't remember the revolution, I mean, the story about Iraq and the story of Afghanistan, I mean, it, the techniques are apparent and uh, it resonates. But I had some difficulty with the film with a few things. One was the historian who objected to making sandwiches, but she came up with the statement that was left hanging without explanation, nobody else came in on it. She said that the revolution was already unsupported by 1983. Mm. She said they couldn't get volunteers, the whole thing fell apart. There was nothing else in the film to substantiate that with any material to understand what happened. And for us here in New York, we couldn't understand what was happening. And the fact that this was an ultra left uh, counter revolution in some sense, um, or attempting to push it further in some area, it was hard to tell what was going on. And at the same time, it was hard to know whether the people who overthrew Bishop were the coordinated with the American invasion. And we were trying to figure it out. I mean, we were all at loose ends. I mean, we didn't have a, a group to figure it out. But those of us who were paying attention, like me, couldn't figure it out. And I was hoping I would get more from the film. But when she leaves that thing hanging, and the filmmaker leaves it hanging, I mean, I thought it was pretty important. And she came through as one of the more sophisticated uh, participant observers. It was a big hole there that was also created about what had happened in that regard. And um, I wondered if you people had this uh, information about what connection there was between the um, revolution on the ground and the American invasion, and whether the CIA was connected with this, and because I have never been able to get that information myself. Maybe if I Googled something today, I might get more, but that's where our archives are, unfortunately. So um, using the film as a means of analyzing documentaries and aesthetics, that's another interesting discussion, but I'm most interested in analysis of the revolution itself and what was lost, because I'm still feeling that pain, and I didn't have anybody killed on the ground. So I'd like to know. Thank you. Thank you, man. Here's a young person. <laughs> well, I, was, I found it very interesting what you were saying about memory, because I, I don't remember. So, and, and I was wondering how we remember and who remembers what. And I was thinking that in that point is where the American imperialism narrative matters a lot. Because one of the bridges that I found very interesting was this idea of the African origins and the English speaking nation and how that talks to the, Amer to the US society, American society, let's say. But if, if, if you're talking about Chile or if you're talking about Brazil or if you're talking about, I don't know, Argentina and all these other places where you had like military dictatorships that were helped, that were, you know, substantially held by the CIA, then you really wonder what are those breaches that will make it interesting or not interesting, like relevant for an American to, to remember these things? I mean, what makes me care about that that is even more distant than these other things that are already distant? And I think this rhetoric of American imperialism is exactly what joins all these historical moments together, rather than being something that deviates the, atten the attention from the object you were trying to analyze. And if you take it to that point, then then I remember. Because then there's a bunch of other things, like just they were saying, that have happened within the same type of narrative of you know going and bombing you with democracy somewhere else. So I don't know. Well, while you're still taking notes, I'll just say something quickly. I mean, I'm I actually disagree with people on the question of why, why, why is the film specifically about, I mean, maybe I'm distorting people's comment, um, rather about sort of this close reading of Grenada 
and and not this kind of um, you know linking up these these uh, link, seeing it through the prism of American imperialism, because there there is a there is a problem I think in in telling these kind of stories. I think you said it like where does the Caribbean lie in the Cold War? Like if you we will never be able to then tell those stories with their own agency. So I mean it's obvious that there was a revolution. There were these uh, local conflicts and disputes over the direction of it, like uh, the, the young woman who said that this was a, uh, um, you know, is it an ultra left uh, to improve the, I mean, I found that actually, because I think, I think reducing it or, or saying like, so in what way were the, were the were having one ultra revolutionary or are they counter revolutionary? What is their relationship to the invasion? I, I think this was a low, the, the way I'm kind of reading it, it's like it's a, there's a quarrel locally about the direction of, of the revolution, and then it creates, I think, the pretext. Mm. So you have this problem of like, how do we remember something like that? Like, how do we, how do we in, in it? I mean, I'm gonna, speaking from Southern Africa, for example, we were sitting there watching the film, and I was like, this is sort of something like, imagine people in the ANC start fighting with each other, and the defense force gets involved. This is the ruling party in South Africa. And then people get killed. And then we sort of said, well, this did happen in South Africa with Marikana, where you had a mine, a platinum mine, which is owned by a multinational corporation. There is a union that has a glorious record in the struggle against apartheid, the National Union of Mine Workers, but is allied closely to the state. In fact, the former secretary general is now the deputy president of the country. There is another union who, well, this, this National Union of Mine Workers is so close to the state that they don't care anymore about the conditions of workers, their wages, their working conditions, et cetera, their bonuses, their health, their housing. So a smaller union actually emerged, a kind of like more sort of ultra leftist union emerged. Um, and then this, the state colluding with the, I mean, it, it's questionable, like, you know, because there was a public commission, but it didn't lead to any um, conclusive answers. But there's clear evidence, it seems, where uh, the state, the mining corporation, elements within the union that's close to the government, uh, almost all agreed we have to solve this problem. And then there, were, there was a massacre um, of 30, 34 miners. So this stuff happens. And so when you sit back and you're trying to understand it, the, I, I think the, the, not the easiest, but like uh, the most, the, 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 the first, Reading would be to, to to read it as like this is this is what capital does, mm -hmm. but I think we we have to we have to actually also accept that there there's local agency. There are these political actors that made decisions that have catastrophic consequences, and then we have to deal with it. I think that just, this is what I when I first saw the film. I think I was telling you earlier when I first saw the film. I. I grew up with, and as I was saying at the at the introduction, and I perhaps didn't um, lay it out really well, but like I grew up with Granada. The memory of Granada was like Reagan and the Marines invaded this small country, and I think in like a day and a half or something. This is kind of my memory. They they killed the revolution. That's how I just remembered it. When I got the film, you know, the screener, and I was watching it sort of in in the office, I was like, whoa. I didn't know about all this other, I mean, I was a kid, right? So now that I'm being confronted, I was like, oh, I didn't know that all this other, all this like local content was going on, all this agency, this fight over the direction of a revolution. And I found that, that is what I think is way, way more interesting. I think that's what's happening in Zimbabwe that people often don't want to deal with, but that's what's happening in Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, that's what, that, that's, what's hap that's what's happening in Mozambique or something. That is what's happening in South Africa right now. And maybe, maybe because I was being sort of subjective about my own place where I was coming from in viewing it, I was way more supportive, I think, of that localness of the film. That, that, because sometimes when, when I viewed the first time, I was just like, why is it spending so much time with the detail of this attack? And I was like, once I, once I made that connection, no, it is important to, to, to put this emphasis on local agency. I think it does matter that we have to do that. We have to, if we are gonna confront like, mm -hmm. what do we do with the future of social movements? Like, how do we build better kinds of social movements? Your question about like, can you have a state and can you have criticism? Can, can you know, this is something that it seems uh, uh, Bishop Dem couldn't, they couldn't figure out 
I mean, was it a thousand people? No, somebody's not. It was actually three thousand. I mean, this is that's a bad thing. So like, it's having to confront those difficult questions that I think a film like this um, helps us with. Yeah, I think um, just to start with that, the last point, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm making a false binary between the local and the global, or even um, how we're understanding American imperialism and what's going on in Grenada. But um, I'm taking very seriously the possibility of what would it mean to imagine the global through the Caribbean, right? So it's like, how can we actually take this story not to displace American imperialism, right? But to figure out where does it fashion or figure, where does it show up in unexpected places, right? In this context, it's a school, right? It's, yes, it's a farce, it's mostly a lie, yes. But nevertheless, they say it's the school that's motivating their decision to go inside. And we could argue the legitimacy of that, but it also allows us to understand the interconnection between what a lot of universities are doing right now, which is global education, and what is still existing as an American superpower. I know that the entire global situation has changed, but it's allowing us to understand how do these institutions work with these imperial forms as well. Another important way to think about um, not just American imperialism, but how to connect Pinochet, how to connect these other um, events is to think about, going back to education, the School of Americas, right? And how the School of Americas has a very material um, history of training people and then sending them out in order to do the work that needs to be done to, as you said, drop bombs like democracy, right? Um, the, the, the point that, um, man, that you had around the, the the hole that was left. I think that was a brilliant way of formulating it, um, especially with um, the historian's point about popular support, because I don't have an answer about the connection to the CIA, but I do have a question that this film forces me to ask, is what happens, what does it mean when it starts off talking about the popular support that the movement had, and we have at the end, Edward Siaga saying that he's doing this for mm -hmm. the people. Yep. So how does the popular in the 1980s, in, and yes, they could have different ideological backgrounds, yes. They could have different arguments. They could all be lying, right? But the figure of the popular, of the people, seems to justify violence in this context. In particular way, though, in the global, and that may be a place for us to think about the Cold War. Is the Cold War superpowers, or is it superpowers acting in behalf of the people? Right? And that may help us better understand the terrain that we've had inherited. And especially right now when we're trying to rethink what socialism looks like. Right? I think that's the brilliant moment that we're in right now where the closest thing to socialism we have in the United States is what? Um, campaign finance reform and $15 wages. Right? We have to rethink what socialism is to go beyond that as well. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and then we have to wrap it up. Sorry, Jim. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, you just got my memory banks. I remember when that film, when that stuff was filmed. I, um, I was just wondering about the work that reconciliation is doing, especially at the end of the film, the way that it's kind of posed as the sort of, the, well, it feels like there's a, there's a narrative going on that mourning is a kind of linear process with a concrete ending, which is this kind of reconciliation. Um, and it feels like a sort of foreclosure of the possibilities of, of that revolution, of remembering that, re that revolution in a way that is full and not in a way that, that kind of relegates it to the past, you know? Um, and so I, I guess I was just thrown by why reconciliation becomes such a, a major sort of goal at the end of the film. <laughs> um, and that seems to be sort of evading everyone and, and nobody seems to understand why. <laughs> um, anyway, that was it. Reconciliation versus what? Um, versus any other kind of option, I suppose. That just just that that reconciliation feels like an ending to me. To and um, I just I thought that that was uh, strange. It is. A, I mean, just a quick comment. I thought I also thought it was odd that at the end of the film, after he he sort of ends with with going back to the memory of Bishop with the kids singing, and then you. Yeah, bishops. I kind of remember you see bishop, and then you see like a shot of like a the bay, and then over the credit, like right before the credits, he has to insert this. I thought it yeah. was an odd choice, like having having sort of like led us down this path of like, hey, there are no easy answers to what happened here. Suddenly at the end, he's like reinserting this um, almost like a set 
some kind of certainty. Uh, yeah, it was weird. Yeah. yeah, and I wonder if it is yeah. really an aesthetic question. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's more reasons to talk about reconciliation, but it provided closure for the film and it made it more valid, right? It's like, I went to these people and we did the work versus leaving it where it was. I wanted the film to end a little bit earlier <laughs> because I felt the messiness was actually much more interesting. And that is often a, a, a consequence also of, I'm not, I don't know if this is in his case, but like often like funders are like, you <laughs> oh, know, was... did you have some workshops? So it might, you know, we don't know. There's probably aesthetic reasons for yeah. it, but it, there's often like, did you did you have your meetings with the- The outcomes. Can you, show, can you show the outcomes? And so you just include that at the end of the film. <laughs> You mentioned something about Siaga. There's a difference in Manley's politics and what happened to Manley before Siaga took power. Yes. That, that is directly right. No, that's true. Hidden hand in this country. Right? Yes. No, it's definitely. But he both his people on behalf of the people, and that's. I think well, that's, I mean, it, you know, that's a political question. You got be thankful you're not in the room full of certain Jamaicans because <laughs> all the board of that room is on the front. Definitely two different parties, and there's a big difference. Yes, yes, that, yes. You know, and the other, the other piece I would say, looking at what happens in Africa, I understand what's going on in South Africa, but I would say, look at it through the eyes of what happened in the Congo. Mm -hmm. Remember, the U.S. had the chicken hand, and then they, they basically knocked off the Lumumba very quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's different in a counter-revolution in a quick motion like that, versus if you had a long-term struggle, then you had uh, and, and also, I would say, this is the, the Caribbean would struggle to keeping, you know, what they call uh, Arab is called neo-colonialism. Okay, what what products do they want, and who wants it? Which Koch which Koch brothers or whatever is going, to, you know, pull the, pull the coattails of the president and send the arms. You know, remember, there was a general that kind of had a discussion about it in a speech. You know, there's a reason why. It's of the Marines when they had the election when in when in with bayonets and so they said, well, if you pick the right person, we're not leaving. With the bayonets pointing at the people in, the, uh, in their government trying to make a vote. Yes, I think that's a really important point. I know there was last time, but last moment, but um, we're, we're left to also ask, what about the Caribbean today? I think while this film does allow us to talk about the 1980s, what's brilliant is that it ends with these children Right, that point to this possible future, but now those children are what, 33 years older, mm -hmm. right? Um, like, what is happening in the Caribbean today? What happens to sovereignty in Martinique, where the very soil is poisoning its people? What happens when you have like the conditions of um, humanitarian aid and Haiti brings cholera, well, right? Giuliani and Kelly give a speech, and next thing you've got prison pipeline, big time in Trinidad today. So we, I think it's, it's, the challenge is for us to actually go back to the Caribbean and try to figure out how might we rem remember it as well, just as we try to remember this past moment. Um, can I just thank Niger for, for coming and um, at short notice and participating. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and to Gabriella for her great organization. Um, thanks for it. And thanks for coming to the screening. Thank you.